Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce and to have Gordon, Gordon keeping speaking in this summer session from Quarantine Talks from the Kitchen, uh, even though he's talk, is speaking from the library, his mm -hmm. library. Uh, Gordon, I, I, I have the pleasure to know him for more, I mean, 20 years already, Gordon, yeah, something I like that. So. Yeah. I, I don't want to reveal how old we are, but yeah, we <laughs> know each other for a long time. Um, we, we share many of those years teaching at Columbia. Uh, Gordon, Gordon is, um, he raised, uh, initially studied engineer, then he did his architecture education here on SIA. He graduated in 95. He's one of our distinguished alum. Uh, he has a very, um, a very heavy pedigree of the people that he worked with. He worked with Philip Johnson. He worked with uh, Pay Cov uh, and, and, and partners. Um, and he has his own practice for, for, for a long time in New York called GTEC. He has been teaching in Columbia for the last 20 years and counting. And uh, he also taught in Harvard and in Yale. And he has built uh, and he, uh, he has built uh, in, in, in many places and different kind of projects. I mean, some of you may know the, the, the Issey Miyake flagship store in Chelsea, New York, among one of them. He has published uh, a series of books. So he's, he's, really, um, he's really the kind of architect that we aspire than everybody who graduated from Sire to become. Somebody who practices, somebody who teaches, somebody who writes, somebody who thinks. And it is with great pleasure to announce that he will be teaching this fall in SIARC. Uh, he will be teaching a vertical studio. So uh, for those of you who are continuing students, I think this is a really good opportunity to get to, to get a glimpse of, of, of Gordon Mine. I, I asked him, like I asked everybody in this lecture series, um, since uh, as I said last week, Vera is the only, uh, the only non-alum in the lecture series. Everybody else is, 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 is a graduate from SIA from different times. And I asked all of them to show their thesis project. So by the way, part of his thesis project is part of the permanent collection of MoMA. So I, I think that's also a really cool thing for, for everybody to know. Um, so I'm really looking forward to see the lecture, but also very intrigued with this basic idea that I think is important for many of the students in the audience is to see how the, the work that you do at the end of your student career, it can become in many ways the roots or the seeds of whatever you will develop later in your career. So it is in that context that I'm looking, I'm very much looking forward to Gordon's talk tonight. Um, so Gordon, welcome, thank you for doing this. Um, and the, the Zoom screen is yours. Great, thanks Hernan. Uh, indeed a pleasure um, to, to uh, give this talk today. Um, 25 years almost uh, to the day that I presented the thesis in uh, January of 95. Um, I'll jump right in. Um, back in the day, uh, Sire had a, um, a program called Public Access Press. I don't know if you still have it, but it was a, a program which allowed students, faculty to publish uh, books. Um, and there was like a thousand dollars stipend to help with printing and uh, production <clears throat> distribution costs. So I took advantage of this shortly after graduating. Um, and put together the thesis project in, in a book. This was a still from, <clears throat> from uh, uh, one portion of the thesis as the cover. This is a two page spread. I'm gonna present the, the, um, the thesis work, roughly half the presentation um, um, from the book. So from the two page spreads of the book. Um, the book back in the day when there was architecture bookstores in New York, uh, uh, the, the hundred uh, prints um, copies um, sold at a good clip. And so uh, 90, 1997, um, I tapped public access press again and did a second edition. And then uh, when Hernan asked me to speak, um, um, I had to go through 25 year old, 20 year old files um, that I did, uh, that I, pr I produced on a Macintosh back in the day and uh, <clears throat> translate them to um, 
current software. So that was that was a fun exercise. And now I, um, I'm, I'm releasing this third edition as a PDF, and it'll be available for uh, for download on the website. Um, so the um, the thesis um, and well, uh, the publication basically um, has this strange notation system, which because uh, you're going to see it throughout the presentation, and I'll just explain it to you. Basically, there's there's uh, project numbers of which there are three. So that's the first digit. Then a section within the project, and then each paragraph of the text is um, uh, gets its unique um, number in uh, in binary, basically. Um, on the left, uh, part of Public Access Press at SciArc, um, uh, as part of the deal, we had to post this um, inclusion and diversity uh, message uh, <clears throat> 25 years ago, uh, which is uh, interesting uh, uh, and uh, maybe uh, 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 new relevance uh, as of late. Um, the three the three parts um, are uh, information control, mapping information, and the domestic landscape. Information control is the main body of of the work, and and it consists of four experiments, which I call controls, and they're experiments in, in information flow, and then there's four juries. So the experiments took place, experiment one, and then interim thesis jury one took place. The jury became the, the territory on which that which was learned from the experiments was essentially performed. So in, in, in one way of looking at it, you know, the jury was the project and you'll see what I mean. Mapping information is just a lot of writing, um, the, the theoretical underpinnings and uh, the domestic landscape um, is a house basically that also learns from the writings, but also the experiments and the, and the juries. Um, so uh, the, the, the thesis is called Ordinary Diagrams. Um, and um, it's essentially um, um, the, the, the the, the simple idea is that all these things that were radical and new in, uh, in the mid 90s, you know, pre uh, wide access to the web, um, no cell phones, uh, uh, but there was a revolution going on in information, electronic information technologies and, and communications. And, um, and the, the thesis became that these things are gonna just be become very mundane and, and uh, ubiquitous and part of our, our, our everyday, which essentially has been fulfilled. And I will bring the thesis full circle to where we are today. Um, large bibliography, Noam Chomsky, you know, Walter Benjamin, um, you know, Manuel de Landa, Foucault, um, Diller and Scafidio, Dan Graham, uh, Marshall McLuhan, Venturi, Scott Brown, Paul Virilio, Mark Wigley. Um, so it's like those were uh, the people that were um, <clears throat> timely uh, uh, at the time and, and particularly resonated with, with the work I was doing. So the, um, the first, um, let's just, just changing this here. So the first uh, experiment, which I called a control. So control number one was a, a cafe on the corner of Alameda and Olympic, just near, it's fairly close to the school. I used to live near it. It's called the TV Cafe. I looked it up, it torn down uh, for a condo on, uh, in 2012. But uh, essentially uh, what distinguished the cafe is uh, 10 or 20 TVs hanging all over the place. And, um, and um, so this is the, the banquettes and then the kitchen. And I was sitting here and I, I, I will just in a minute show a video pan of, of the cafe. But typically the notation here, the red is, is the field of view of cameras and the green um, are monitors and what monitors are displaying. <clears throat> 
So um, what I derived from the, um, the TV cafe were four, um, let's say characteristic information flow types. Uh, one was Kino. It's I don't know if you guys still play it out there. We don't have it here, but it's a it's just a, a, a game. Um, I, I think there's gambling involved, but you you can play it remotely and you look at the screen. So to characterize that, it's you know we could say it's diversion, it's entertainment, and it the the information flow is in one direction. Source is originating outside of the space that we're occupying. Um, and, and entering into the space. The second typology, let's say, was, uh, was, was TV. Again, one unidirectional flow of information. The information is generated outside and flows into, um, it flows into, a, um, into a space. Um, there were surveillance cameras. So, um, the surveillance camera, uh, there was two, two sort of typologies. The first being the typical where, you know, you see the camera, you're, you're, you know you're being watched, you're under the gaze, it imposes, uh, you know, if you want to go to Foucault, it, it imposes a kind of discipline on your behavior because you're being watched. Um, and the, the direction of the flow of information is from the space you occupy out. Um, and you know, to recording or to somebody who's monitoring the, the camera. The most uh, interesting was uh, the second type of surveillance where uh, that which was being filmed or, or, or scanned uh, was pro projected back into the TV cafe. So some of those monitors were actually showing you the, the inhabitants of the space under surveillance. So that was a kind of, let's say for me at the time, um, uh, a new typology. And then, so the next slides are just that video pan through the TV cafe. So following this analysis, I presented a jury uh, to a jury for an inter interim review. And to apply some of those sort of lessons, uh, we were in the main space, if anyone knows the old school, it was a huge room, uh, double height room. And we sat in the middle, no pinning up. Um, I was just explaining the re research. And uh, so the jury, if you could see my mouse, Yes, and, um, and uh, in the plan here, the jury sat in a row. They were um, under surveillance with a camera and they, they, their image, uh, their live image was pro pro projected back to them from a, a monitor. I sat in front of them out of the field of view and presented my work. The second, experiment, let's say, was called electronic skin. And this took place in the entry to SciArc, uh, you see in the plan. Again, I'm gonna show some still images and I'll show a little video of um, two people walking through the entry. They are under surveillance again with a camera that's very visible and a monitor beside it. They see themselves, but through an analog sort of process, I substituted the figure of the person walking through the, the lobby with a second channel, which was daytime television. So you see your figure and you know it's you, but your features are gone. And instead you have daytime television playing within you. So, um, um, and just, uh, to read a, a sentence, the body of the passerby becomes a projection screen. The representation of the self to the self within the space of the gallery is that of a mass media event. The, the body simultaneously, literally, and metaphorically defined by an external event. So here's this couple. One of them uh, happens to be me and my classmate, Joe Blackburn, walking through the lobby. Um, and basically, because the outside is so bright, 
your profile is dark. And so we did a, a brightness mat and mix the two channels based on brightness so that as you're walking through, you have the daytime television within your uh, body. The, the jury that followed that installation or experiment, um, I, I constructed um, in plan, you can see here, these black screens, just like in a black foam core with a wood structure and uh, uh, put the jury in front of the black screens and used a, a, a color mat so that everything that was black, oh, I'm sorry, I should show the, let me show you the video of, uh, of uh, that entry sequence. So this is daytime television superimposed on, on the body. So we only had 640 by 480 back then. So <laughs> low res, um, let me bring this up. Okay, so yeah, the jury that followed, again, the black screens as backdrop, jury sitting in front, uh, I was to present outside of the field of the, of the camera. Um, again, the jury was presented back to itself, except this time uh, the jury uh, was uh, substituted with uh, color noise and uh, in live. And Michael Bell, who uh, I guess Hernan and I taught with uh, at Columbia, he's still there. And uh, we always have a good laugh about this. He was doing a lecture at SciArc and they asked him to sit in on my, uh, on my interim uh, jury here, and he refused to get in the field of the camera. And he insisted after about five minutes or more, he said, I'll get in if you get in. So I was like, fine. So <clears throat> again, the jury format uh, got pushed by his reluctance, and I sat with the jury um, again with our, with our uh, bodies altered in, in real time while I presented the ideas of the thesis. The, the third experiment was an analysis of Fox News there, uh, and, and its studio. Um, there's three cameras, the dead on one, the semicircular desk, the anchor clones, as I called them, mimicking the idealized family. You know, there's always the dad, the mom, the uncles. And then the kids are the correspondents out in the field. And they present this idealized view of, of, of family that allows us, the, 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 the theory goes here, um, to more easily accept their inevitably biased uh, depictions of, of the news. Behind is a control room. Um, so, and these are just some stills from um, that particular newscast um, with the anchor clones, as I call them, mimicking the idealized family. Um, the jury um, was quite interesting here. Uh, Robert Mangurian um, on the left side of this image. Sylvia Levin, who I uh, should mention, was my advisor, who was incredible and pushed me and pushed the project um, into... Uh, a place that I was really happy with, um, and Marco Sinzati and me. By this time, I had just accepted that I am part of the jury. I sat with the jury. I, pro I projected on the, on the back wall um, from a projector in the main space, this is where lectures took place at SciArc, um, a pre-recorded uh, um, uh, broadcast of, the, of a Fox News um, uh, episode. I built a one-to-one -one, um, sort of desk um, uh, mimicking the anchor desk. We sat behind the desk and we were scanned by a, a, a camera on, the, on, on axes. And there was two monitors. One pro projected the, the event of us and the backdrop to ourselves and the other was projected or, or, or directed at the audience. It gave the audience the chance 
or, or the choice of being able to watch the live event or the mediated event. Robert Mangurian uh, uh, said a couple of things um, during the presentation. And he said in his 25 years of teaching, he has not seen a jury um, uh, performance or, or seen uh, uh, radicalized uh, so successfully, he actually said. And um, the other thing that was really interesting from, from Robert Mangurian, who sat on all my juries, I think one of the earlier ones, he said, oh, all this stuff you're talking about, all this, you know, new technologies, radical, uh, you, know, you know, changes that we're undertaking. He said, um, you know, eventually these things are just gonna be like that. And he pointed to an electrical outlet on the wall, you know, making reference to the electric revolution or the invention of the printing press, you know, which all became normalized. And in fact, um, that was a big re revelation for me in that, uh, yes, that's, that's right now these ideas and right now meaning 1995, were emerging and I was attempting to unpack them and look at how architecture can be a participant or, in, or affected by these. Um, and, uh, and, but in fact, you know, ultimately they would be normalized as they are now. And hence the, uh, the title of the, of the uh, thesis, Ordinary Diagrams. So the, the fourth experiment um, it really gets into the house. And um, this is a formula on the right side, um, basically about pixels and viewing distance. So there's a comfortable viewing distance based on the cone of projection of the human eye. Um, I won't go into the numbers. Um, that is a pixelated screen. There's a comfortable distance from which you sit. Um, there's a distance that um, text is legible on a screen. And then there's a distance that that only the image is really discernible on the screen. This really set up the, the, um, the, the house design. So there, this is a graph which basically takes the formulas and looks at screen height and width, um, distance from the projection screen and like pixel height. Um, and, um, and this set up the house essentially, um, set up the, the size of the screen within the house, the proximity of the living room furniture to the screen, the, the distance of the screen within the house to the sidewalk to read, be able to read text, and then distance from the roadway um, for um, uh, passing traffic to be able to um, see what's in the house. And I'll get a little bit more clear on that in a second. So really the, the next pieces are all about the display surface, um, and um, and then living room and entrance volume and bedrooms all coming coming to be defined by this criteria established through the flows of information. Bathroom and garage included. Um, so the the plans um, uh, of the house. So this is uh, let's say um, a lower on the left and an upper plan. The living room here, double height, you see the living room furniture, um, the bedrooms uh, on behind. This is this uh, glass display wall. And on the display wall is the projection screen, which was uh, something like eight foot four uh, wide. And based on the formula that determined the distance that the kitchen and, um, and um, and uh, living room furniture were from uh, the screen. And a, a lot of the lessons learned in the various experiments and juries were deployed through the house. To make a, a very long story short, sure. the idea is that through this overexposed living room where so you're under surveillance, the surveillance is projected, what you're watching um, on, from the web, is projected, the TV you're watching is projected, and that's projected so that people walking by can see and people driving by can see. We call this, you know, the living room, this overexposed zone. And you could argue that, <clears throat> that at this time, that time and now, that 
the private realm, the house, the living room was no longer private once information like television, for example, came to, to, um, to, um, to invade it. So the private space was rendered a public space was the argument. And so there's a little bit of a critique there in that um, um, and, and a solution by pumping up the, the sort of infiltration of outside information and communication of information that's taking place within the living room to the public through this glass box enclosure that we restore some sense of privacy to the largely opaque bedroom areas. So there's four bedrooms, two on the lower, two on the upper level, a stair going up, and then this overexposed zone. That's a bathroom and a carport. Um, it was a glass box with metal, perf there's a roof plan, metal perforation, perforations, uh, metal panels perforated so that uh, light would come through and view would come through. Um, uh, but it would mitigate the effects of uh, the solar effects this is the section of the screen within the house and um, uh, so on. And, and that leads to the final jury where I built the dis this glass display wall, a one-to-one -one, um, prototype um, of it. Um, it's 12 feet tall or something. And uh, I just built a four foot section there's the screen. And unfortunately, this was the only picture that somebody took that I was able to use. But I rebuilt the furniture, I built the actual furniture uh, designed and built as a one to one prop. And uh, basically with the screen and the display wall simulated the living room environment for the final. Um, one uh, fun fact is that um, um, my thesis was the first at SciArc to be performed solely on the computer. No models, no printouts. Um, the, the making involved uh, electronic apparatus deployed and one-to-one -one, um, pieces like the, the, the Fox desk and the living room furniture. So just to uh, close it uh, on the thesis, this is a, if you, if you step back 10 feet from your computer, you could see that this pixelated image is OJ's eyeball. And, um, and this was like the, 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 the piece that's in MoMA is called Entity as Information Zoom. And I used basically this zoom of this fine, into this final image um, to separate sections in the publication. And, um, and then uh, this is the uh, finale. Uh, another fun fact, a three-day rendering on Form Z in 1995, 640 by 480. And, uh, and so when it came time to, to, to do the book, you know, all I had was this rendering, you know, my friend helped me on the thesis. His name is Michael McPhail. And he, he was the computer ace and he did this 640 by 480. And, um, and, but I needed more of a feel to tell the story. So I started to just extend the lines of the raised floor and the, and the mullions uh, of the glass box living room to get more of a field and then place my figure from that earlier installation. But the iconic mass media event at the time was OJ and, in trial. And so again, to give a sort of fuller picture of what the thesis was saying, you know, we are the information we consume is like a simple sort of uh, story for it. So, um, you know, the, 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 the path to MoMA was uh, in 1999, um, um, Terrence Riley uh, did a show called The Unprivate House. I know there was a couple of SciArc uh, um, professors in the in the show. I know Tom Baresh, who was my first teacher at uh, SciArc, was part of it. Um, and basically, I didn't I didn't make the, the show, but I was mentioned in Ter Terry's essay. And he made a comparison of the Farnsworth house to this house um, from the thesis and stated the overexposure that was enabled by glass um, it was similar to the overexposure enabled by this electronic apparatus. And so what do I do? Uh, as soon as it, I get this reference, I print out 
um, a large version of the final plate and I donate it to MoMA and they accept it in their collection. Um, it was um, uh, displayed first in the, in the show Cut and Paste. Pedro Godano was the curator. We got Cool House, we've got Riser Momoto and um, Mencilla Tunyon and, uh, and the piece here. Um, uh, Mabel Wilson, um, a fellow Columbia professor, wrote an essay in this book published last year um, entitled, among others, Blackness at MoMA. MoMA published the book um, and, um, and included the piece because uh, the book was documenting all black artists in the MoMA collection. Uh, her essay was specifically about the architecture and design collection. Philip Johnson, my old employer, started in uh, 1930 or 32 or something. And strangely, uh, you know, I learned when Mabel interviewed me that my piece was the second piece um, in the collection of the architecture and design department at MoMA uh, by somebody Black, um, which uh, they accepted the piece in 2000. The first piece was, a, I think, a piece of textile in 1975. And I found that, you know, quite, quite shocking. Um, and then uh, lastly, with, uh, with, this, with this playing out this MoMA thing, um, this is the inaugural exhibition opened last fall in the renovated um, um, MoMA. Um, some Stephen Hall, my good friends at Low Tech, Amanda Williams, and here's the piece here. Um, just in, as an interesting aside, which I wasn't going to say, but uh, there's a footnote in Mabel's uh, essay that says that Ricardo Scafidio, who's mixed race, part black, um, does have work in, in MoMA in the design collection as to Dillard Scafidio, but he uh, doesn't self-identify as black, so she excluded him, uh, which was <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, so um, here is a uh, moving into work since, um, this is an office uh, in um, uh, sh shortly after starting my own uh, firm, um, somewhere around 2003 or so. Uh, this is the entry corridor, uh, the door, and at the end of the corridor is a monitor and a camera. And um, basically the entrant a person enters the corridor, walks down the corridor, gets filmed, and the, uh, this is done on a computer live, the white background gets matted out and you get uh, substituted with, a, with a, a field of sunflowers. So it's basically, uh, you're viewing yourself elsewhere as a um, device thing. Um, so yeah, those are just the, the screenshots of that. Um, another project, um, it was, a, we were asked by, um, by is I think 2004, 2005, um, asked by uh, Thelma Golden at the Studio Museum in Harlem um, to consider um, Harlem basically. And she asked 18 architects and designers, black. Um, uh, Harlem was under gentrification and development and um, and she felt that it wasn't being considered architecturally. So we had really an open, um, an open uh, uh, sort of field to, from which to, uh, of what type of project to pursue. And so I started the project as I often do with a, an urban analysis of all of Upper Manhattan from 96th Street North, um, looked at green spaces, population densities, large pieces of um, large institutions, major infrastructure, vacant lots. And um, came across a map of uh, public libraries, size of the dot representing the number of volumes. And this struck me as uh, for half the island of Manhattan, not a lot of libraries um, and the proximity did not seem right. So I did a comparison of Manhattan libraries to Helsinki and to Toronto. 
And something interesting about the three maps is that they're not to the same physical scale. They are sized based on, let's, let's say, a square centimeter having the same population in this map versus this map versus this map. But you can see the disparity in upper Manhattan. So the, the proposal became, um, let's try to fix that disparity and laid down a grid of of new public libraries. And to be realistic, you know, they weren't gonna build beautiful public buildings and, and stock them full of books. So this was gonna be an all electronic library. So we shuffled that grid to correspond to population density, removing branches where branches already existed, shuffled the locations to sit on 25 by 100 foot vacant lots of which there were very many in upper Manhattan. And then the design became something that was prototypical and repeatable, an elevator shaft, staggered platforms, a staircase um, and a field, a grass field, which essentially becomes a public park. Um, uh, and basically this replaces what is previously a fenced off vacant lot. The facade consisted of three uh, elements, the a, a, a touch screen, transparent touch screen, glazed units and opaque units. And the, the seemingly random uh, orientation or, or arrangement of the, of the, of the touch screens, which is where the books are, where the information is, um, are basically um, corresponding in different ways to each of these platforms in order to allow people to sit on their, you know, cross their legs, stand up, wheelchair, um, you know, varying heights. And so the uh, end result was um, this piece in a vacant lot or a courtyard lot beside the actual studio museum, proudly displaying the African-American flag here on 125th Street. Um, another project which is closely related to the thesis, you know, the, the house in the thesis um, was, you know, done in an LA mindset, a single family house on a lot with side yards and front yards. And uh, right after graduation, I moved to New York and, uh, and that's not a, a very common typology at all in Manhattan. Um, most people living in apartment buildings. So I, I wanted to look at what, what we could do in the way of a project um, to apply this to a dense urban condition. And so again, you have this living room with all the uh, uh, media inputs coming into it. And, and, and it becomes overexposed, and I'll explain that in a second, to restore the bedroom area as private. The idea being you just want to get rid of being surveyed. You want to get rid of all the barrage of information and, 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 and sort of retire to your, uh, your private realm of your bedroom and hence restore some sense of privacy to the domestic enclosure, which is invaded by all these, um, uh, uh, all this media. So the, the design was, uh, besides the electronic apparatus inside, was for a screen that was an OLED screen sandwiched between two pieces of glass. And the, the uh, this is a, a public housing project and so the, it's, it's, it's um, not intended to be an actual product that gets sold, but the, you know, the story goes, like you go and buy your air conditioner and pop it in your window, you go and buy this, what I call home broadcast window and apply it to the facade outside of your apartment. And something that's interesting, and you know, I'm, try, I'm gonna try and bring this full circle is, the, one of the critiques of the thesis was that there's six companies that control all the information we're consuming through media. And, and that was a problem because with the bias in, the, in that information. And so the, the design was like a, a, a commentary on empowering people to become broadcast nodes. The source of information that people are being served is 
the source is generating from people within your community, from your neighbors. So you buy this thing, you pin it on the outside of your house, your overexposed zone is, is, uh, is, um, is uh, exposed and you essentially become a broadcasting node. The full circle part is so with social media and the emergence of social media, um, we are broadcasting nodes. Um, we do record information. We do post it and share it. And, uh, and essentially that has functioned to weaken the dominance of you know, mainstream media in that we all become broadcasters. And we can see the revolution that's happening now with, you know, the, you know, what took place in Central Park with the bird watcher, dog walker. We can say it with George Floyd. Um, and we can see that we are empowered to broadcast through, you know, a handheld device, which again is kind of bringing a full circle, um, the, the thesis project um, and just, um, probably not totally necessary, but uh, the video to accompany that, um, which showed the, 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 you know, I always use a, an iconic mass media event. And this, at the time this was produced was the, uh, the Iraq war, you know, the mission accomplished. Um, so um, moving on, um, this was a two hour project. Um, done just prior to uh, Obama being elected. The storefront um, for art and architecture in New York uh, ran a competition called uh, White House Redux. And um, there was, I think a thousand or so entries. And ours was, uh, we did it in you know a couple hours with Photoshop and we painted it black in anticipation of, of uh, Barack Obama. And, um, I, I show this project, uh, you know, um, just because um, it's timely in that, um, you know, not only does the, um, you know, White House need a paint job, um, but also it's a, um, a monument and monuments are, um, are uh, really uh, in the uh, in the crosshairs, and the and the White House being a monument constructed largely with slave labor, uh, African slave labor. So um, I just threw that back in there. Next project, Tony Griffin was the city planning uh, director at, in the city of Newark. Uh, Cory Booker was the mayor, uh, and. Uh, a number of offices were and individuals were invited to uh, propose a gateway project for New Newark. So this is the city of Newark and the ends uh, uh, identify the gateways. This box identifies the zone that my office was assigned. And um, there's a freeway running through it. And, um, and these are the gateways we identified. Um, Newark has a huge problem with brownfields. These are sites that need remediation because uh, it was an industrial town and uh, a lot of sites are contaminated. Again, zeroing in on our zone. Um, this is population density of Newark, um, which we looked at again in our zone. And our solution was to uh, use Again, you know, like it's it's all fine to propose to uh, to um, you know remediate all the sites, but realistically, that didn't seem like uh, a, you know a, a cash-strapped city like Newark was in a position to do. So, uh, and plus, we were asked to do a gateway project. So we we looked at the mustard plant as a natural uh, means of 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 cleaning soil, and um, and that's that's our zone. The idea being that we plant mustard um, on the contaminated sites, and then uh, when the sites are clean, they become public green space. So this is a uh, one of the off ramps to the freeway, freeway, a gateway. Another aspect of the project was this scrolling text, giving local news, uh, you know, topical matters um, uh, for the community and also progress on the, on the big remediation 
project being scrolled at each gateway. So our, our, our project was to, you know, again, this is, you know, just post Obama and, you know, talking about call to service. And this is about harnessing the community to, to clean up the sites and plant this mustard, uh, which would eventually give way to green space. And uh, that was one site. Another, uh, an abutting municipality, so that the gateway was, uh, you just had to walk down the sidewalk and you go from, I can't remember which town, into Newark. Um, so we uh, embedded the scrolling text into the pavement. Again, uh, enlisting the community to clean or you know, to plant uh, the mustard. The mustard grows, the soil gets cleaned, and we have green space. Um, another was a bridge into Newark. Um, again, community, mustard, which is also effective in, in cleaning water, um, and, then, and then green space and a view into the, the bridge. I, there's a couple of um, videos that you know, we put together. So the scrolling text, and this is in the mustard phase. Um, and um, the sidewalk um, version, the scrolling text, um, just to like a replacement for welcome to Newark sign in green with white writing. And um, uh, the final, that's the, the bridge driving in. Okay. So um, this project, I, I don't wanna take up too much time. I wanna make sure we have time for discussion. So I'll, I'll blow through this one, if you don't mind. This is the Lower East Side. Um, it was a, a project uh, that I proposed for the studio at GSD. Um, and we did a version uh, like we actually did the work in the office simultaneous to the students doing the work. Um, this is the Williamsburg Bridge, Manhattan and Brooklyn Bridge. Again, a kind of urban analysis looking at green spaces. We're looking at the high density housing, largely public housing in this zone. We're looking at infrastructure. We've got a Department of Sanitation facility. We've got the spaces under the bridges at this time closed off. So unused and closed off, largely used for Department of uh, Transportation storage and things like that. And um, so, and then this is the Lower East Side. This is, this is what everyone loves. This is where there's, you know, old tenement buildings, a, a nice six story streetscape, um, fire escapes all over the place, bars and restaurants, great restaurants. This is, this is, you know, living. And, um, and this is the East River Park where um, uh, shop recently finished uh, the, the renovation for. And there's really no connection. The, the public housing are all fenced off. There's no real access through, or for that matter, from the folks in public housing to this new park, which is now extended all the way uh, past the Brooklyn Bridge. And so our proposal was to basically turn this infrastructural zone under the Williamsburg Bridge into uh, a, a green space. And um, so I'm gonna, again, I apologize. We can always come back to it, but I'm going to burn through these uh, slides, the before and after a theater building, like a, a, a performance space green space and a skate park were, the, and, uh, were, were proposed. New circulation, so some of the, the roads com coming through um, get cut off to facilitate the green space. And then, um, you know, bike lanes, which are dead ends are connected in the proposal. Uh, bus routes uh, get relocated. The, there's a motif of the sound wave. Uh, interestingly, the Williamsburg Bridge has the JM uh, uh, Z trains. So under this bridge is incredibly noisy. So we took the motif of a, a diminishing sound wave and uh, tamed it and made it our landscape motif. We looked at sun studies, 
perfect shading in the summer and and um, and um, um, uh, direct sun in the winter uh, due to the sun angles, uh, skate park, undulating landscape, and uh, performance box. So um, and you know I won't get into the performance box, but it's a flexible black box theater um, that's very reconfigurable. Um, a simple expression of the black box and a stage. And, um, and then basically, apart from the sound where trains are traveling here and a performance space with indoor and outdoor uh, stage and a large uh, airplane hangar door to open the inside and to the outside and a park where you can view the performances except for this sea of columns. So the, the, one of the aspects of the project is, to, uh, is that there would be an app that you can download on your phone and uh, watch and listen to the performances which are heavily sur surveyed and, and, um, and recorded um, uh, so that this 2000 foot long park um, uh, uh, can be a place uh, where you uh, where you picnic and experience these um, these performances. Um, two more projects. Um, this is a space in Harlem for um, tutoring and mentoring at risk Black and Latino boys, and it uses golf as a medium. Uh, to tutor and mentor. So the plan basically um, it has three golf simulator bays. Um, golf simulators are um, super sophisticated. Um, um, this is a radar unit. This is an actual golf ball. You whack the golf ball. Uh, you're playing a specific course. The ball is tracked through this radar and you watch the trajectory of the ball, all sorts of statistics on your, uh, plus other kinds of video monitoring of your swing, allow this kind of analysis. So the, the boys get this kind of exposure. They form the golf team of their school up here in Harlem and um, compete against other high schools. And um, um, yeah, and in, in the day, the, the PGA pros who teach the kids, um, um, actually give private lessons to make the nonprofit sort of uh, viable. Um, and so then there's these uh, uh, desks for the tutoring. They use lessons of like the trajectory of the ball, the physics of the swing, et cetera, et cetera, in their lessons to the kids. Um, the, there's a library. And this is the interesting work of uh, artist Charles McGill, who, who's recently deceased. African American artist who takes old golf bags and 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 uh, repurposes them as these works of art into clan masks and and um, and spiritual masks and other uh, things. So um, so that's that space. That was the exterior existing in a new building. Uh, we did the identity for them, um, and they've since uh, uh, and. Uh, taken on a larger space, about twice as much area. Um, we almost finished um, the, the, the construction of this new space. We gave them a little bit of a updated identity for the facade um, and uh, then COVID struck. And, and so we haven't uh, opened again and we haven't been there to photograph it. Um, final project today uh, is a house in Toronto. Um, uh, this is a current project. We've just finished uh, concept design. We're going into schematic design. Um, this is an interesting street. Toronto largely has house, backyard, garage, laneway, and then the mirror of that. So, but this block is particularly narrow. And so this street, Hawken Avenue, uh, and this is our site, this garage. Um, our site um, uh, essentially um, um, uh, sits on, again, this, uh, this street of garages. 
somebody built in their backyard here, we're gonna do the same. So um, basically, um, uh, we remove the garage, we move the property line. There just happened to be a property line here where the garage is a separate lot, but my client lives in this house and we're building their new house here and they'll rent out the old one. So to do that, we're gonna move the property line, locate the house, and then a simple diagram um, for the arrangement of the house. A service shaft, i.e. bathrooms and, and stuff, <laughs> and a light shaft. And, um, and so um, entry in the front, again, the service shaft continuous, uh, the light shaft continuous, uh, kitchen and living room deck, et cetera. And then the second floor, the master bedroom and kids' bedrooms uh, and, a, and a green roof. So um, you can always judge an architect by their bathrooms. Um, uh, might seem strange, but we uh, almost like the first thing we did was to basically lay out our bathrooms. Um, I don't like walls sticking in my bathrooms. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that, you know, that I have a problem with in bathrooms. So that's a, the first step was laying out the bathrooms for the various zones. Um, we stack the bathrooms um, to line up toilets and, and vertical plumbing in a uh, full height shaft. We looked at circulation surrounding the, the, the service shaft. Here's a stacked stair. Here's a spiral stair. Here's a terrace stair, which we ultimately used. Um, we sat that service core and circulation within the box. The box gets pushed to create a carport. The, the, the basement extends to create a deck in the back and more area in the basement. We step back the second floor to provide a deck for the master bedroom. Um, and then we looked at the envelope. Now this is essentially before we even had a meeting with the client. So this was just like laying like the, the, the sort of the, the lay of the land, a client that's never built a house before and just sort of warming them up. So, you know, we had the, the cube um, for, the, for the enclosure. We had the shifted boxes. We have the rotated boxes. You know, we have curtains and solids. We have iconography of a house uh, on a box. We have a free form shape on a box. We have triangulated planes and, you know, a kind of connect the dot scheme. So basically this is just um, uh, giving the, um, the client a kind of range of approaches and, and also warming us up into the process. So um, I will, for time, not show one version. So, um, and I'll move to the, the, the version that we're ultimately gonna build. Um, I'll only say that in the version I'm not showing, um, we have south facing Tesla um, solar panels. We uh, have uh, glazed exposure uh, behind retractable uh, industrial grade greenhouse curtains. We have a planted roof. Um, so we call the version that we are continuing to work with the wedge with the terraced stair. Um, the, first the stacked bathrooms, the terraced stair, living spaces, bedroom spaces, natural light, solar panels, green roof. An early version of the model made out of foam and foam core and a cutaway version and the rendered floor plans. I'm sorry if I'm going, if I'm burning through this, but this was the, um, I guess two, three months ago, just prior to COVID actually shut down. This is the version that we presented to the client. Again, the Tesla panels, um, which are meant for sloped roofs, but we're going to mount them vertically on the south facade, and then the wet, the wedge um, glazing on two sides. Um, just to bring this all around, um, we, you know, 
in case you didn't uh, register, we have this piece in MoMA and so many people would kill artists, architects, you know, uh, to have, have a piece in MoMA. And, and it's a kind of form of representation, this, this collage that I haven't ventured into since, um, since this was produced. You know, we've got, we went full on into photo real renderings and we've just found that in the office, we can't compete with some of these rendering houses offshore, you know, whether it's Poland, Norway, China, wherever that, that are producing these phenomenal renderings and we can't do them, but yet the rendering is still a part of our design process. We need the rendering in order to advance the design. So I look back to, you know, something, let's say, you know, uh, uh, something of value, notoriety that I that I produce, and this is the piece from the thesis, and then looked at um, how we might, and we're still working on it, it's an ongoing project, but looking at how we might learn from the collage, the figure, the line work, the limited rendering, the white field, and produce a, um, a kind of, a, a, a motif, a style of how we show our work. And so something that uh, just over uh, the COVID break that we've been working on is, you know, how do we, uh, what is the kind of fenestration we, we, we use for the west facade and the east facade, which I'll show in a second. Uh, the west facade is where the open terrace stair and a retractable skylight reside. So we want to use this with large glazed openings um, uh, as a stack to facilitate natural ventilation. The west sun heating further heating up the air within the stack, which causes it to rise and evacuate out the retractable skylight. Um, and that in turn draws air from somewhere else in the building. And in this case, we have these slender triangles um, on, the, um, on the program facade, side, the east facade. So the vertical slots um, block the, uh, the morning sun, um, which is coming in at an angle uh, every time, uh, all times of the year. Um, yet the operability of the windows allows air to be drawn in so that the stack to, to let's say fuel the stack and, and naturally ventilate the house. We're using geothermal um, uh, uh, radiant heat and cool. Uh, we, we have the green roof, we have the solar panels on the facade. Uh, the, the building is proposed to be CLT, uh, cross laminated timber for the slabs, the stairs, the interior and exterior walls. Um, and, um, and that's all she wrote. 59 oh. minutes, 48 seconds. <laughs> there you go. Um, Gordon, I mean, this will be the time that we, you will get a, a, a loud round of applause, but we are in Zoom. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Terrific, terrific lecture. So many things to unpack. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, I think you 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 always define um, the architect by by the bathroom. I think that's a title for a book, and I think we should make a book about that. Um, uh, in the interest of time, because it's it's um, it's already eleven o'clock, eleven ten for you in, in New York. So I, I just I, I just gonna uh, as I always say, I invite people who are watching YouTube to join us in Zoom if they want, and also encourage people to ask question directly or write it in chat. And I'm happy to read it to Gordon. I'll, I'll, I'll get us going with the first question and, and hope everybody else jump on it. I, I really want to, um, I think that in the way that you build the lecture, I, I think there is a, a super interesting connection from the thesis all the way to some of the more recent work. But I, I want to revisit the, the, the issue of surveillance. And this is something that, uh, and of course, being in 95 already surveillance was among, uh, among us and, and but, of course, after 9-11 and in recent time with social media and so on, they have taken a whole exponential other dimension of it. But there is a, there is a, a recurrent interest in, in, in the relation of your work with information. I mean, even if we do it with a kind of a, the kind of a more low tech in, in the new port with the, with, the, with, the, with the graphics in, in, in the red thing or, 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 or the TVs. But there is something um, 
there's something remarkable about that kind of a closing loop because one one could argue that always architecture has been a mechanism of surveillance, right? So there is a relation that I keep presenting, but I also like the idea, uh, uh, or I would like you to talk a little bit more about that. It seems to be the concealed effort to also uh, keep it with kind of a, a kind of a low tech quality to it that it doesn't become. It's not about the interactivity. It's about it's about the almost as is that the surveillance and the screens are used as materials, as, as an architectural material. And I think that's I find that super provocative. So I wonder if you wanna if you wanna elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, I mean the um, the technology typically is reflective of the time in which it's it was generated, and it uh, and you know we, we've. You can't believe from 1995 to today where where we've come from that Form Z rendering at 640 by 480, which took you know days to what we can do now with a with a um, a rate hardware ray chased graphics card, you know, and all these gaming computers and and in arch with architects as well. Um, so the showing a lot of those videos now, I mean they're painfully low tech. They're, they're grainy. A lot of them, all of them, in fact, were, sh or, well, the, the thesis ones were shot on, on actual magnetic tape and, and then, you know, digitized uh, much later. Um, so, but at the time, uh, you know, th that wasn't old, old school. That was like, that's what we did. And even some of the, the the later videos, you know, done in the early 2000s were, wow, an architecture office instead of a rendering. Yeah. I, mean, I was working yeah, for yeah, people yeah. who were doing, they were doing watercolors, you know, we'd pay the watercolor guy to, to, to paint up the building. So, you know, the, the, the uh, renderings, uh, or sorry, the videos of, uh, to represent the project at the time were like, wow, SOM doesn't do that, we do that. But what's interestingly happened is that not only has the information technology caught up to the point where it may not even be productive for architects to make these kind of projections about the technology when you have a company with billions of dollars and some of the brightest minds like a, like a Google who are innovating in, in, in some of the most incredible ways, like it or not. Um, so that's the kind of full circle that's come. So to answer your question, you know, in a, from everything from our fonts to our images uh, throughout the, the 30 years I've been doing this, they're always a marker of a point in time. And yeah. the, some of them are low tech and we're doing other things now. You know, that's just, it's just a marker. I got, I got over it, you know. Um, yeah. But and another sort of, point, you know, this comment by Robert Mangurian that, you know, this is just going to become like a, a outlet, yeah. you know, electrical outlet, that has been fulfilled, which has allowed me, you know, to put it in the context of thesis and beyond, has allowed me to move into something else, because the project is done. You could say that the handheld the, and social media looking at what happened with George Floyd, for example, I mean, the, the surveillance, which is turned typically on people to, um, to, uh, to sort of facilitate the gaze and, and a kind of discipline. Yeah, I mean, it's like a positive surveillance now. Yeah, it's been distributed, it's, it's democratized. Everyone's a surveillance camera and the police are being surveyed now. You know, it's like, um, and so anyway, it's, um, well, I hope I answered your question somewhat there. No, I, I, I think I think you're touching on it. Um, as I said, I want to open to everybody else. I think Joe Day, class of '94, I think one year before you, has a question. Oh, so we we we, we, we have a three to memory line of the night. <laughs> Where are you? I want to see you on Zoom here. <laughs> I'm. Well, I'm not sure. I'm, it's a big grid. It's a big grid tonight, Gordon. You got a lot, a lot of traffic, and I'm happy about. I'm, it's great to see you. Fantastic. Good to see you as well. Yeah, it's been a long um, time. I've yeah, heard about it's it, but... really, really a pleasure in a, in a hundred different ways. Both the you know both uh, 
I, I want to try not to wallow in nostalgia much, but it really was a pleasure to see this. Your thesis was a kind of abiding regret of mine that I, I finished just a semester off you and was out of town, I think, when you finished up. And it was legendary, you know, it, it was, it, it really was, a, was an incredible, incredible production. Thank you. And I think, um, you know, to, the, to your last point a little bit, I think our mid 90s, our mid 90s cohort was dealing with a lot of, you know, the vision and visuality and scopic technologies and surveillance and, and spectacle. That was sort of the air we breathe, we were breathing, I think, as computers were becoming a much more sophisticated and pervasive part of everyone's life, but really before they had become so much the, so much the game. Um, it's really a pleasure just to see and be reminded of some of the weird rigors that we brought to that kind of, that kind of discussion at the time. I really do think that 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 ren the the rendering you have at, at MoMA and the one that you're working on on now, I I really like the second, the East View, Gordon, and I think you're getting close to some of the frisian of the first one, and I think mm -hmm. it has something to do. There's a kind of double scope to that first one, both the you know the rendering that you described and the kind of proto denarian like before Neil figured out how to get to get Form Z to really do things, you, you were figuring right. out what what was possible, but also the OJ graphics and the degree to which it was both disciplinary and vastly topical and broad in its broad in its engagement. And I, I have a feeling, I, just as a thought, as you're working on the one you're working on, trying to figure out how to how to kind of deal in that simultaneity in some way. I'm not sure how you do it, but I, my my thought and my my thought that I'd leave you with tonight. I'm I'm positive Marshall McLuhan's been heavy on your mind. You are his yeah. countryman, and you know I was thinking as you said, you know you you are the media you eat or something, and uh, and I think uh, it seems. There's plenty, plenty of mileage left there. But the person who I thought really reverberates through your work in a, <clears throat> in a compelling way, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on is Dan Graham. And frankly, right. I really think, you know, it was so true of all of us in the 90s at SciArc that there was always an artist or two who might actually have been more central to our interests than the architects. And in yeah. your case, Dan Graham seems like such a clear and re resonant point of reference. No, absolutely. I mean, I've got 12 inches of uh, Dan Graham somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, he's definitely, I mean, and and what I like is his trajectory and the diversity in his work as well. Like, um, you know, just maybe more peripherally, some of the, like the, the, the photographs of the Jersey houses, you know, just some of this, like the mundaneness of it and the, and as such the beauty, you know, and I, I, I really do celebrate some of these very mundane, um, you know, striking almost, you know, so mundane, they, 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 they verge on the sublime. Um, but, you know, it, during this research, it was the early video installation. I was going to say that that's really, it's, and in fact, I, I feel like Gordon, yeah, at the time, I remember feeling like you were you're incredibly prescient about, you know, there were artists that looked at architecture and then we were just starting to look at those artists. And I have a feeling both of you and I probably got lucky in terms of some conversations with Sylvia that helped on that front. But in any case, it's such a pleasure. I'm so glad you're headed this way. I can't wait, can't wait to see in the fall. Yeah, I so good. hope it's less mediated than this, though I suppose this is apt in a way. <laughs> But they, you know, on on the Dan Graham subject, the you know the 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 architectural work, the the the, and I mean by that the the pieces of glass, the glass pavilions, for example, uh, set within a museum uh, uh, context or in a field, curved glass or um, or flat glass. Now the ability to use that medium in a very simple way in order to create a different relationship between strangers occupying a piece is incredible. You don't know whether somebody is standing in front of you or, or you're, you're behind you due to the reflection. And so the, the kind of interaction that is uh, induced by those pieces, quite simple geometric pieces that you occupy around and through uh, creates a, a social, relationship. So he started with the video, that was really moving, but then all of a sudden he's using 
physical, architectural sort of materials and apparatus to create relationships. And isn't that what, what we do? You know, uh, so even if it's like, you know, in the context of a museum, but that's an aspiration for us in architecture. Yeah. I, I, can I, can I, can I, can I add to that or like trail off on that sort of convert point? Cause I think that one of the, I, this was really fun. I really love, I love, I loved hearing. I loved, it was like a, it was a total pleasure. And I, um, I, I wonder about, you know, when I was struck about you talking about your thesis was how, um, yes, about the media, but also um, the app, the, the app that the kind of apparatus, the kind of performance that was enacted, the kind of total environment. And, and I'm really interested in now, like in the last project you showed, the way in which you set up a sort of conversation around the building as a sort of weather system and the sort of performance in that sense. And whether or not, and, 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 and yeah, maybe, I mean, I'm curious about those drawings, the drawings you're starting to do maybe, but, but also about the building itself and how, um, I don't know, how, how maybe the, some of these systems, visual or maybe not so visual, maybe now, um, um, are, are now participants in your thinking about the kind of the, the way in which uh, the performance, let's, let's say the performance, the performance of architecture. Mm. Yeah, um, it's interesting. It's, it's um, again, you know, tying it back to the thesis project and the thesis and beyond. And mine in particular, where I feel like the, the, the ordinary diagrams that I, you know, described or uh, identified um, are essentially, you know, the, the, the project has been fulfilled, I feel, that it's, it's all like what was radical is now just a part of us. And I was teaching these studios, you know, next bay from Hernan at Columbia, uh, which were extensions of the, of the, the, of the ideas uh, of, from the thesis. And we got to a point where, um, like I would propose a studio, like early days, propose a studio, you know, in the year 1999 or 2000. And five years later, the stuff we were talking about actually got realized. Got to a point where, you know, we would propose, like I remember proposing an app and a building. One can't work with the other. And that's what we're gonna do this semester. We're gonna design an app and we're gonna design a building. And then the Metropolitan Museum, midway through the studio came out with an app to navigate their building. Now we say, oh, of course, that's, you know, everyone does that. But then it was like, it was these kind of premonitions of what could be. And then, you know, these things were happening and, and they're happening so rapidly. And now again, like, you know, these like companies like Google are insanely, you know, um, um, uh, able to, to, to produce a kind of future. And so the, the point is, um, I've allowed the thesis project to uh, to sort of find its arc, and so the 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 the, the pieces there, the, the the aspects of the new project, let's say that that you define, are still very much in formation. You know, I got to a certain point where I was like, I want to build. That's what I want to do. I want to build. I want to build a building, and um, and 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 so right now even 25 years after school you know and and venturing into um you know a rediscovery of uh, a, a mode of representation in those renderings and collage um i'm still very much on a learning path you know i'm in an in invention path so performance oh we could talk about um, the sustainability credentials, which are, should be a part of every project and not necessarily a thing. Um, uh, so that's certainly a part of it. But I can't say that I've constructed a thes the thesis right now, but I can say that that is the project that I'm working on. Cool. Um, we have a question in the chat for you, Gordon, from David Eskenazi. Uh, he says, hi, Gordon, thank you for the wonderful lecture. I'm wondering about your selection process of the imagery you use and how those images hold up as you look back at them today. 
when there is an event, is there a specific kind of image that you decide to use? What's funny is how so many of the images you select haven't changed nearly as much as the technology has. Um, I mean, uh, the imagery, meaning the iconic mass media events, for example, uh, like the OJ or the, the Iraq war and, 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 and uh, those. I see, I see David nodding. I think that's what was, uh, go yeah. ahead, David. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I was just curious because A, I, um, the OJ Simpson trial just had so much imagery associated with it and you have to select something and um, and, and Iraq wars as well, although the ones you choose are, are certainly iconic. Um, it, it, but I was, I, it was funny as you were presenting it, I was like, oh yeah, like Fox, Fox News still looks like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, uh, like the president still, I mean, you know, kind of still looks like that. Like there, no matter, even though that like, it's, you know, like the technologies and all these things were, were perhaps have, have changed over time. Like there's certain um, kinds of contents and kinds of things that, that, that create mass media events that are still similar, you know, we still have those things, you know, even today, perhaps more often than we used to maybe, but um, I don't know, I was just curious as you look back at, on all the work, like how you, A, how you choose uh, the images that you choose and, and B, yeah, like how do you, you know, like, it's funny how some things hold up over time and some things don't, you know, and a lot of it has. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's similar to, um, you know, my response to Hernan about like the low tech, like the, the, I guess early on, I got used to the fact that, um, that, you know, technology is going to advance, we're going to get better graphics cards and faster processors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, better able to render, et cetera. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go back to, you know, 70 projects and redo them, right? So it just became almost an embrace of a point in time in which they were produced, whether it's the, the grainy video from magnetic tape or, you know, an iconic uh, mass media event. It's like, you know, the, 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 it was, I guess, a deliberate decision. Often we were like, oh shit, what are we going to put on these screens? Like, what are we going to put? Like the, the OJ figure, when we talk about the house that we're working on now, you know, oh God, what, what are we going to put there? Like, you know, the classic rendering, you, you go, you buy some perfect people and you put them in the building or in front of the building, walking on the sidewalk, holding hands. Everything's got to be a mixed couple now, even in, in like, you know, mainstream commercials, right? Um, but, you know, uh, not wanting to sound dumb, but it's the client's dog, right? <laughs> you know, we use the client's dog. And, you know, alluding to back to, you know, what Joe was saying, we're not there yet, you know, as far as, you know, cooking the representation moving forward, but we are marking a point in time and a point in our development and, uh, and we will see where it goes. And it's exciting to actually have a project as opposed to, you know, just doing it the way we do it. You know, it's, it's uh, I, I, that kind of stuff brings me joy. I feel sometimes like I'm the luckiest guy ever because especially if somebody's paying me and this is what I I'm doing and somebody's paying me, you know, so having the project for me is, 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 you know, uh, the fulfilling part, the project of trying to figure out where the project's going. Right? Um, maybe one or two more. Let me see 11 in your time zone, Gordon. So Anna, I think you want to ask something. Hi, yes, I'd love to. Hi, Gordon. Uh, so good to meet you. Um, I, I was so struck by the image of the White House uh, painted black. And of course, that image comes as a kind of optimistic um, image in uh, because of the Obama presidency. And now um, we have the Trump presidency. And a couple of days ago, um, I think I read that uh, when the protesters were trying to topple down the uh, Andrew Jackson statue, uh, Trump uh, is kind of putting together now the executive order to uh, to basically um, allow for uh, for the monuments for the federal monuments to be quite protected and to put a lot of 
uh, pressure on, on, on the kind of security around these, around the parks. And I wonder if you could speak to this because your work really bridges so many scales, uh, kind of public art, um, urbanism and, and architecture and design. And how, um, what, is, what, are, what are your thoughts? What are your hopes and suggestions for public monuments? And where do we go, where do we go from here? Um, because so many of the federal monuments um, are representing uh, uh, the Confederate history <laughs> in many ways. And um, so much of uh, the current government is uh, protecting, protecting these monuments. So what, what can we do as architects? Well, first vote, <laughs> um, you know, um, but um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it just uh, occurred to me in the last day or two with the, um, you know, as I was putting this together with the, with the Black White House and simultaneously, you know, I'm a news junkie and seeing, you know, the toppling of the monuments um, both, uh, you know, sort of the crowd, but also administrations are, are, are uh, sponsoring this now, certain administrations, localities, jurisdictions. And it, I put two to two together. I'm like, holy shit, the White House is the ultimate monument to, you know, it's even called the White House. <laughs> and when is that going to go into the crosshairs? When is when are people going to say, you know, this house built by slaves, um, African slaves, you know, is not the seat of the president of this country. We are, you know, we don't accept it. Like, can it go there? You know, is an interesting question. Now, what what a monument should be? Hmm. Um, uh, that's that's interesting. Um, you know, memorializing uh, architecture as general in general as as you know the one one theory might have it that we produce monuments to our own mortality as architects, right? And every every project is a monument, and we want you know that's going to outlive us, and that's 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 what we do as architects. Um, it could be argued. Um, and what is a, a monument? What should a monument be? Um, and um, yes, uh, <laughs> it's a great question. And uh, I, I give a little landscape, but um, I, I, you know, I would have strategies to pursue a monument from the design perspective, but I certainly don't have uh, a, a, an overarching theory of the monument. Yeah. Um, we have one. Uh, we have another question from the chat, uh, Gordon from Jesse Jesse Gates. Uh, it says, "Thank you, Gordon. I'm mesmerized by the inversion in your work and career arc, the way that the OJ collage inverts the projection space toward rather than out from. The viewer is clairvoyant. I am thinking about the inversion of the domestic space we have the potential to occupy now." That is the inversion of the domestic from a space of consumption to a space of production. Now that we all stream ourselves on Twitch or Zoom, we now coordinate our private spaces for production and performance. Do you think the performance of the domestic space could open new architectural potential? Um, definitely. I mean, delivering a talk like this, um, you know, making sure I'm, uh, this is pre-COVID, let's say, making sure I'm groomed, conscious of the image I'm projecting with my attire. Um, um, as let's say considerations in, in that sort of public presentation, all of a sudden now it's, what is my library? Is my head in the way of the Shumi books, which I want everyone to know that that's, that's, that's my guy. Um, you know, I'm wearing flip flops, you know, I could be sipping on alcohol, you wouldn't know it. Um, in my, you know, so I mean, there's, there's, a, <laughs> I'll catch up in a minute. Um, there's a, absolutely a whole set of considerations and the environment that we that that we perform in now 
whether it's a talk like this, whether it's a home office, whether it's um, uh, a Zoom meeting, um, or whether it's, uh, you know, posting our meals or other reposting things on, uh, on social media. Um, uh, and uh, so the domestic environment has to respond to that. The thesis project said, you know, the, the communication between the private realm, the domestic, domestic enclosure and public space was a window, you know, at one point. And then, um, you know, cut through many chapters in the evolution of the home and, and it becomes a television um, or like, let's say, uh, part of the interaction with the public becomes this one-way flow of information into your space uh, through the television. And that renders your private space no longer private when the public's inside. You know, you could say metaphorically, but you could say actually. Now, with these new constraints, new considerations, um, uh, yes, domestic space has to evolve. This is, this is the question. This is our question. This is a question for us now as architects. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm almost feeling a lack of not being able to say how specifically it's going to evolve. But again, that is the project, you know, to determine, to determine that. One thing I lament is that, you know, there, you know, the nostalgia of wanting to restore, um, you know, uh, unviolated private realm, which, you know, so the, the, the progressive radical thesis of 1994 actually has a, a huge bout of nostalgia. I mean, I'm trying to restore privacy, you know, by overexposing uh, through the latest technology, the living room so that we can, we can recapture the privacy of our bedroom. So now when um, everywhere is public and not only in one direction, both directions, uh, it's, it, the question is reframed and architecture is absolutely uh, uh, going to have to respond to that and be part of that, that reframing. I think that was a great question to wrap it up uh, and a great answer. Gordon, again, terrific lecture. Um, looking forward to your studio in the fall here in, in LA and SIAC or whatever version we will have. Um, so uh, fantastic, and I know you'll be around in the summer for thesis reviews and other things. So this was fantastic. I hope I hope I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I hope it was not too painful to revisit thesis. No, um, to go back there. Um, I, I think it was it was uh, it was a treat for all of us to to navigate it. Yeah, th thank you very much, Hernan. Uh, it was it was it was really fun working on putting this together, and I. Um, I really appreciate um, the audience. I re I'm really looking forward to SciArc in the fall. And uh, I like the questions because the questions have now uh, just pushed me to start to formulate what is a studio for now? And yeah. let's, let's see where it goes. Yeah. I think I think I think that's the issue for all of us. So, uh, Gordon, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I clap from my from my home. Um, looking forward, uh, you and I will be talking soon anyway. Uh, everybody else, thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, next, uh, we'll, I'll see you. Uh, I hope I see all of you next Wednesday.